Today's reading is from the book of Romans, chapter 12, verses 3 to 8. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function, so we, though many, are one body in Christ, and individually members of one another. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them, if prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. This is the word of the Lord. Please be seated. We're just doing a little three-week series on uh, Romans chapter 12, talking about this word revival. We're actually going to be starting a whole series of the whole book of Romans on uh, September 11th, but I just wanted to uh, focus on this for just a few weeks because I, as I was saying, as I uh, traveled more a little bit on my sabbatical, we were struck with just how many places um, seemed to be spiritually dry. Um, and that, that burdened us. And we're definitely living in a time when there's a growing number of people who have who've wandered away from uh, what they held dear. And a revival is really when the people who, who, who say they know or say they knew God, where their hearts are revived and, and they kind of cling back. And so last week, my challenge to everyone through the first part, Romans, uh, just the first part of Romans 12 was, are you bold enough? I said, revival is really just you being bold enough to enjoy the fact that you have been saved, that you have been called. And so this last week, the challenge was to be bold and to really think about how have we conformed to the patterns of this world? This week, we're going to be looking at a few other verses in Romans 12. And the question I have is, do you really know what you have? Do you know what you have? We're going to be talking about God. Do you understand what you have when you have God as your father through Jesus? Uh, recently, a few months ago, uh, we, we bought a, not a brand new car, but we bought a new car a couple years ago. And just thought I understood how everything worked and I was driving it. And then there was a button that's always been on the side that it just kind of whatever. Um, I didn't know what it did, what it does. And so I finally, uh, uh, about a month or two into the, where the gas prices have shot sky high, I thought it would just open up the manual that's been sitting in the car the whole time and read what the button was. And the button was the gas economy, which would, the car would, you can, I don't know why this is an option, by the way. Why wouldn't you want your car to regulate the gas? But apparently you can unpress it and waste all the gas you want. But if you push it, um, the, gar, the car kind of pays attention and burns less gas. And I keep track of, the, the car automatically keeps track. And I notice depressing the button saves, like, I get like eight miles more a gallon. I've had this car for two years. <laughs> The button's been sitting there the whole time, staring at me and me looking at it saying, I don't care. And then realizing I had that button option to me the whole time. When we're talking about God's grace, just do you understand what it is you have coming at you? That's what we're going to talk about today. So please pray with me. Father, we thank you for this time together. Holy Spirit, we ask um, that you would first and foremost bless our children May they grow up never knowing a day without you as their Savior. We pray for their parents, Lord, that you would give their parents grace and wisdom to share. We pray for all those who work with kids, Lord, that you would do the same in their hearts. Father, we pray for any adult children who have wandered away. Holy Spirit, please draw them back. Revive their hearts. And we pray now, Holy Spirit, for all those listening, that through your word we would die to sin, become more alive to you. This is our hope. This is our goal. This is our prayer. Father, we ask all this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. So uh, just dig into, we're going to see this, there's a few things uh, I'm trying to, when I'm trying to uh, pack this passage that we're looking at uh, in Romans today, uh, verses three through eight, there's just three sections I'm just going to uh, separate it by. Um, the first one is 12.3. For by the grace given to me, this is Paul writing, and he's just, remember, talked about where to live as living sacrifices, no longer, you know, we're going to set our, our bodies to the Lord and we're going to no longer conform by the transform, renew of our mind. And he goes on to this. That was last week. Now here is, 
For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. So the first thing I want us to understand is humility. Grace, humility through grace. That grace, remember grace is this unwarranted and undeserved love that Jesus has loved us with that's supposed to prompt us to do everything. Our obedience is based on his grace. Our repentance is based on his grace. Everything, it's based on his grace. And now we're going to see how humility, what Paul is saying here is we need to be humble, but it's best understood through grace. Humility understood any other way will lead to a, a, a religion, a faith that doesn't look like the one Jesus wants. So this verse 12 through 3, I mean verse 3, sorry. Uh, Paul is saying you need to be sober. I want you to think about, Paul is even saying by the grace, even saying by the grace me speaking to you. I'm only speaking to you by the grace that God has given to me. And I want you to think about yourself. I want you to think about what you have. I don't want you to think about more highly than you ought to, but I want you to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of your faith. I want you to contemplate what God has given you. And the first thing he uses his word is they're sober. I want you to be sober. That doesn't mean he's assuming they were drunk, but he is saying, I want you to think as though you weren't drunk. Some of you might think of yourself more highly than you ought to, and he's saying, you sound like a drunk person. You sound ridiculous when it comes to thinking of where you are, where you stand. And again, that prevents you from understanding God's grace. I remember uh, I, I, who hasn't think of themselves more highly than they ought, right? I have, I have many lists I can choose from. My family could, could come up and give 100 each, um, just from yesterday probably. But uh, I remember a time when I was, I was, I was definitely humbled, humbled. Uh, my mom had a coworker with a guy who played college basketball. I had played one year of sixth grade basketball. I was in high school, but I was a little taller than this guy. Not, not like a foot taller, but I was taller. And I thought, I could take you. And I heard him saying when I visited my mom at work one day, I think this was my, it might have been my junior year in high school, that he had played college ball. And I looked at him thinking, well, I'm taller than him. I should be able to beat him in basketball. So I shared that with him. And he was like, bring it on, little guy. And so we went to, an out, we went to a court, a blacktop, and we played. And uh, this is a true story. I'm not quite sure I scored a basket. He hammered me. And remember, I'm taller than him. He destroyed me. And he's like, I played college, man. What are you talking about? I thought of myself more highly than, highly than I should have. I had no humility in talking to someone who's been trained how to play a sport that I'd only played when once in rec league. There's a great passage in the Old Testament where um, uh, Joshua, who's been picked by God to, to replace Moses, he's the successor to Moses' leadership, and there's a time when Joshua, so he's got Moses' blessing, he's got God's blessing. God's asking Joshua to do some mighty, wonderful things, be courageous, be bold. And they've come to this city uh, where they are supposed to bring the city down. And we're going to find they're going to bring it down by marching around it. But before that happens, uh, it says an angel of the Lord, a commander of the army of the Lord appeared to him. And we... we this, was, this might have been Jesus himself, we think, because it's the commander of everything. But it, it was, uh, it was, if it wasn't Jesus himself appearing, it was someone really important in the heavenlies appearing to this guy. And Joshua said to him, hey, this is in 5, 513, are you for us or are you against us? And it's one of my favorite answers in the Bible. The, this angelic leader says neither. Why? Again, he's telling them, you have forgotten your place. You are showing no humility right now. You're standing before the commander of the army of the Lord, and you're, you're asking if I'm for you? The question should be, you know, am, what, what, am, what do you want of me? But you're asking as if I'm working for you. And he was humbled. To be sober when you contemplate the measure that you have been given, they go together with somber judgment, meaning realizing, as scripture says, the height from which you've fallen, remembering 
where you were when God called you, what you had awaiting for you if he hadn't called you, hell, what you were without him calling you, hopeless, and then realizing what you are because he has done all that. This word measure doesn't mean, uh, there's different places, uh, because it talks later about in the spiritual gifts, like use your gift in proportion to the amount of faith you've been given. But here, uh, I would agree, many theologians think this is more talking about, Paul said in the big picture, the measure of faith, not measure as in measuring stick, but measure or is just the idea of portion, the amount. Just how much has he given you of faith? And the answer is enough to believe. How much faith have you been given? Enough to believe. That's all you should ever hope for. Matthew 17, 20 says, faith the size of a mustard seed is enough to call a mountain to fall. The amount of faith isn't as important as the fact that you have faith. And so Paul is saying, think of yourself soberly and about the fact that you have the amount of faith you needed to believe. And all of that comes from the grace of Jesus Christ. Romans 5, 10, the first part says this. Again, when we're trying to contemplate what it means to soberly think about the fact that God's called us, to put us in the right place, the Bible uses the word enemies. Where we were, where we were before Jesus' death on the cross was enemies. We were enemies with God. That's an intense word. We were enemies. Um, R.C. Sproul, a very uh, well-known Roman theologian who passed away in our lifetime, uh, there's a word we use in our uh, theological tradition called total depravity, which means you're completely corrupt. He liked a different word. He used like the word radical corruption in place of total depravity. Radical corruption. Radical because it means the word radical, the root of that means root. That the very beginning, we've been radically corrupted by sin. This is where we start. Unworthy. And this is where Jesus comes and meets us with grace. So Paul is saying we need to start by understanding God's grace. You can't understand God's grace if you don't understand what situation he came to. And the situation he came to is people who are radically corrupt and enemies with God. And those are the people he came to show grace with. The rest of Romans 5.10 says this, For while we were enemies, we were reconciled by God by the death of his son. Much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. This is what was done on our behalf. Grace means grace. He gave us his grace, something undeserved. This is what he has loved us with. And Paul is saying at the very beginning here, you have it. Remember, the title for this is, do you know what you have? You have that grace. That grace was meant for you. And so when I talk about humility that comes from grace, it means that as we understand grace, it should cause us to be humble. And this humility will change the way we look at our relationship with God himself. He becomes even more loving and more wonderful and more necessary. Do you know what you have? You have God's grace. Next, let's look at verses four through five. So again, humility, through grace. Now we're going to look at the unity through grace, but here, for as in one body we have many members, and the members do not have all the same functions. So we, though are many, are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. So we looked at humility. Now we're looking at unity through grace. Grace has brought us a true humility. We understand who we are and what we have in God. And that humility should cause us to be in awe of the fact that God even gave us the faith to believe. He's given us that grace. And now Paul is going on talking about we should have this unity. From that humility should flow unity, not conformity. God doesn't want us all to be the same, and Paul does not either. And he gives the body illustration, which he uses multiple times in different books. Again, he's saying, look at your body, right? Another place that your bodies have different functions, right? Another place that everyone can't be an ear, 
Everyone can't be feet. He says, we have a body. The body works independently and separately at the same time. And he's like, but that's us. But we can't get there without humility. We have to start with humility because humans are so corrupt. We can't be in fellowship with one another without comparing, without discouraging, without not wanting to be around the people we are around. As humans, we like to either be isolated or jealous. We like to be judgmental. We like to be selfish. We can't be that way in a healthy community. And again, it has to start with humility. It has to start with knowing God has loved us and we didn't deserve to be loved. And that's going to mean something to me. And now that that does, again, Paul immediately starts going to your role on this planet. Once you understand God loves you, now let's talk about what you're doing while you're here. And the first thing, this is a passage about a unity that comes from the gospel that can't be found anywhere else. Every ideology, every political party, every country in the world tries to tell you they have a plan for the best way for people to get along. The best way to combat people groups that don't get along. Well, the message of Christ we get from his word. I mean, I'm not going to say they're all wrong, but they're all wrong. <laughs> This only comes, that, that vision only comes from people who understand they are in need of grace and that grace is only found in Jesus. And when that grace comes, what follows after that, Paul is saying, is you now have a new purpose. And he starts with saying, understand your purpose is now to live amongst the other people around you. Just as your body has many parts, yet it's one, so now is the church. The people of God is made up of many people, but at the same time, we are one body of Christ. We are united at the core. 1 Corinthians 1, 12, 26. How, how are we to relate now? What does this look like when it says we are one body made up of many parts? I think this verse sums it up pretty well. It means if, like your body, if one part is hurting, the whole, everything hurts. If one, if you're doing well, everything feels well. It's the same thing with the body of Christ. If we are completely humiliated and humbled by God's grace, and completely motivated by God's grace, then the way we view the people around us obliterates all the barriers and boundaries that we've set up. And we truly now look at them as brothers and sisters in Christ to the point that when they suffer, we suffer. When they are honored, we are honored. When they are in pain, we are in pain. When they're rejoicing, we're rejoicing with them. That's a, a vision that I'm sure Martin Luther King Jr. himself loved. Because the people around us, our bond, our connection to them is based on who our dad is, our spiritual father, Jesus Christ, and his grace. So we are bound. But again, what does this unity look like? Right? It's beyond tolerance. So my friend talking about the difference between, you know, this unity versus tolerance. Imagine in a, a, a wedding ceremony when the husband right there and the, the minister is doing their vows. And instead of saying, do you promise to love and cherish? You would say, do you promise to tolerate your spouse? That's not what we have here. What God wants between us is a unity that is far deeper and far greater to the point when they are suffering, we are suffering. To when they rejoice, we rejoice. This comes from our understanding of grace. This comes from a unity amongst believers in Christ of what we have in God's grace. This is a great passage to talk about why we belong to a church. People are like, where's the verse that says 
join a church and become a church member. Well, those, those particular words don't exist, but these do. That you should be committed to the body so deeply that when one suffers, we all suffer. When we're honored, we all are honored. Again, the grace of God will push you through his love to want to be united to other brothers and sisters in such a way that the world can't even begin to fathom how great it is. This is all through the grace of Christ. It comes from him loving us first, a unity that the world doesn't understand. It's the same thing for married couples. It's the same thing for friends, that friendships in the church should look different than the world. Marriages should look different. Why? Not because of you, but because of God's grace. All of that should point to God's grace. And Paul is saying, Paul is saying, listen, be humbled by his grace. Now be united by his grace. And lastly, let's look at 12 verses 6 through 8. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. If prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving, and one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. The scripture has always been very big. God has always been really big on making sure you do things from the heart. Grace is about the heart. Look at this list. Again, you combine humility and unity, you get passion. A passion that derives from grace. God never, ever wants your acts of service or obedience apart from your heart. He rejects them. He wants your obedience and your faithfulness, but he wants your heart to be right in the middle of it. Why? Because your heart demonstrates whether or not you understand grace. Your motivation for obedience, if it's not grace, it's for some type of merit. If your reason for loving others isn't based on grace, again, it's for some other reason. Guilt, shame, I don't know what it is. But grace is what must be starting it. We want to see, God is saying, I want to see you passionately do what you've been given to do. This is not an exhaustive list of grace. Paul is clear to saying, listen, whatever, whatever you've been given to do on this planet, whatever gifts you've been given naturally, or they've come about, whatever the gifts you have, use them under the understanding of grace. Right? He uses the word zeal and being generous. He's saying, go at it with your heart. But he's always saying, always saying it has to start with your heart. There was a king named Saul in the Old Testament. And Saul was struggling with trusting and following God. And he thought he was doing what God wanted. But every time he, as he was living more and more in his life, he began to live more less focused on God, but still at the same time thinking he was serving God and was talking to this prophet named Samuel. He was like, listen, I'm doing everything right. What's wrong? And Samuel tells him, God wants your heart behind your offering. He wants the obedience. He wants your heart to be there. An offering that means nothing to you means nothing to him. So saying you're following God, but not actually following your heart means nothing. It's the same thing here. God has given you gifts to use, but he wants them to come from his grace. So again, what we have, according to Paul helping us understand what we have in Christ Jesus, again, is we have a humility that will lead us to love God differently. It will lead us to love God differently. We have a unity that doesn't look to the world to define what unity looks like. It looks to God's grace to define what it should look like. Grace makes us look at others differently. And lastly, grace will make, our look, make us look at ourselves differently. We see what we've been given as an extension of that grace. 
And all we want to do, should want to do, is glorify God by sharing that grace, those gifts, with the body of the church around us. Uh, I was reading a, a scholar, and he pointed out that, ha- that about 10% of the Bible is focused on people who aren't, who don't know God. But about 90% of it is focused on people who claim to know God. When you're thinking about these gifts, we might want to immediately think about, I think it's kind of funny, using these gifts for other people because you don't want to use it with the people in your church family. <laughs> I think it's really the reverse, or it's both and. God wants you to be using the gifts he's given you to love the people around you. I think it starts with your spiritual family and it works its way out. There's a great passage in 1 Corinthians where, um, again, Paul is talking about the importance that love, your embracing of God's grace, plays in everything. And this plays very well, works very well with Paul's exhorting the Romans to do. He says this, If I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all the faith so as to remove mountains but have not love, I'm nothing. I think whenever Paul is talking about love, he's obviously referring to the grace that's only found in Jesus Christ. That grace that comes to us who are enemies, who comes to us who had abandoned God, who comes to us who hates others, that grace comes to us and calls us. And now, the great question that I'm posing today is, do you know what you have? God's grace has come to you. Do you understand the power that comes with that grace? The joy that comes with that grace? Do you know what you have? Without grace, I'd say you don't have anything worth any value. Not an eternal perspective, you have nothing. But with grace, eternally, you have everything. You have eternal life. You have eternal hope. You have eternal unity. Purpose. This is what comes to us from God's grace. Do you know what you have? Then share it. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your grace. Lord, help us understand how we did not deserve it. But at the same time, you pour it out on us. Lord, may your grace redefine how we love and obey you, how we view the people around us, and how we use the gifts you've given us. May your grace transform our purpose and identity in this life. We are radically without hope without you. But with your grace, we have a radical hope for this life and the one to come. Jesus, it's in your name we pray. Amen. Please stand for our final song.